When you log into your computer at work, you're probably providing a username, a password, and perhaps some other type of authentication credential. When you go home and you want to connect back to the corporate network using a VPN, you use exactly the same username and password. How does the system at work know to use exactly the same login credentials as your VPN client at home? It's able to do this by using a centralized authentication server and specialized authentication protocols. Let's take the scenario where you are authenticating to a VPN concentrator from home. In this scenario, we have your laptop at home. We have a VPN concentrator. This is probably also a firewall used by your company. There's also behind this firewall an authentication server and ultimately the internal file server that you would like to access. The first step is you at your laptop at home sending a login request to the VPN concentrator. That login request is going to have your username and your password. The VPN concentrator doesn't have any of this authentication information to verify from, so it sends this request down to an authentication server asking to see if the username and password is correct. The authentication server will evaluate your login credentials, and if they are correct, it will send a message back saying that those credentials have been approved. At that point, the VPN concentrator allows you access to the inside of the network because it was able to verify that you use the proper authentication credentials. There are a number of different protocols that can be used between a device and an authentication server in order to validate those credentials, and in this video, we'll step through a number of the most popular protocols in use. You'll sometimes hear these authentication protocols referred to as AAA protocols, or the server that it's connecting to as a AAA server. That AAA stands for Authentication, Authorization, and Accounting. And one of the most popular AAA protocols is RADIUS. This stands for Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service. Although dial-in is in the name of the protocol, this is a type of protocol that can be used on any standard network. We would commonly have a RADIUS server where all of these authentication credentials are stored. This would allow us to centrally authenticate if we were connecting to a router, a switch, or a firewall, or perhaps we're authenticating into a server or accessing a VPN concentrator. Or once you get into the office, maybe you're using those login credentials to access an 802.11 wireless network. Across all of these different devices and all of these different services, we're using exactly the same login credentials thanks to RADIUS. RADIUS has been around for quite some time, and you'll find clients and servers that are able to use RADIUS on many different operating systems. Another popular authentication protocol is TACAX. This is T-A-C-A-C-S. This stands for Terminal Access Controller Access Control System. This was a very early form of authentication that was used to control access to dial-up lines to the early form of the internet known as ARPANET. TACAX has been updated through the years, and a modern version of TACAX is known as TACAX Plus. TACAX Plus provided additional authentication capabilities and more response code details, and it was released as an open standard in 1993. TACAX was widely used with Cisco switches and Cisco routers, and even today, many people associate TACAX with Cisco. If you've ever logged into a Windows domain, then you've probably logged in using the Kerberos protocol. Kerberos is a technology that allows you to authenticate one time, and then you are trusted by the entire system for a certain time frame. This means you can log in one time in the morning, and you can access all of the resources you need on the network without putting in your username and password every time you connect to a new resource. Kerberos uses cryptography to provide mutual authentication, so you're not only authenticating with a server, the server may also be authenticating with you. This provides additional protection against on-path attacks or replay attacks that may be used against you. And although Kerberos has been around since the 1980s, it was first developed at MIT, it's now part of the Windows operating system, so anytime you're logging in with Windows, you're using Kerberos. Behind the scenes, when you first log in to the network, you're requesting a login to something called a ticket granting service, and it's giving you a service ticket once you've authenticated properly. This means that you now have the ability to connect to many different resources on the network by simply showing your service ticket to all of those different resources. This means you can save time by not having to constantly input your username and password to all of these different devices. But once you go outside of that Windows ecosystem, you may find that other devices don't understand Kerberos and are not able to authenticate with that protocol. 
For that reason, you may find yourself adding on additional technologies so that you can still have single sign-on even in a non-Windows environment. So you might be using smart cards, SAML, or some other type of technology for authentication. So now you've heard about the use of many different authentication protocols. The question then becomes, which protocol do you use and in which scenario? Different organizations have different requirements. They might have different authentication servers already set up. And the technologies that you're using may only be able to communicate using one of those different authentication methods. For example, you may be installing a VPN concentrator, and that VPN concentrator only knows how to authenticate to a Radius server. It may be that that VPN software doesn't understand how to authenticate using Kerberos or using TACAX. And it might be that your organization already has a Radius server, which is a perfect match for this VPN software, which can only authenticate to a Radius server. Or you may find that an organization is using TACAX Plus for authentication. And you may find that that organization has a large infrastructure of Cisco devices. And if you're logging in and using Kerberos for authentication, it's very likely your organization is using Microsoft Windows. Although there are advantages and disadvantages to all of these different authentication types, usually we pick the authentication type that makes the most sense for our existing infrastructure. I mentioned earlier that you might be authenticating using a username, a password, and then some other type of authentication factor. If you're using multiple factors during the login process, we refer to that as multi-factor authentication. So you might be using something you are, which is some type of biometric, like a fingerprint, or you may be using something you have. This might be your mobile phone, and you're using an app on your mobile phone to get a code that you can use during the login process. Another type of authentication factor is something you know. Most often, this is something like a password or a personal identification number. You could also be using the factor of somewhere you are. There might be GPS or some type of location services that can verify that you might be inside of a building or within a particular country. And very often, we're using an authentication method that is something you do. If you've ever had to sign to receive a delivery, then you've authenticated using something you do. Some of these authentication methods may be relatively expensive. For example, something you have may require you to have an external hardware token that you carry around with you. Or it might be relatively inexpensive. It might be a free application you load on an existing mobile phone and you have something you have as an additional authentication factor.